Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast. Robert with my co-host, Sports Radio 610, Sean Bajani. And joining us is one of our favorites, USA Today Texans Wires, John Crumpler. Happy Thanksgiving, John. And hey, the Texans, they don't look like turkeys for the first time in years, brother. No, they don't. And Robert, Sean, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, it's crazy that we're already at Thanksgiving and it is a fun time to be covering this team, to be a fan of this team. I don't think, I mean, everyone wanted this direction with a rookie quarterback and with D'Amico Ryans at the helm of it, but I still don't think anyone going back to last February, last March could have imagined it going as, this is going as well as it could have. No doubt about that. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of odd because weekly, People are just throwing all kinds of different praise upon this Texans team. And today, Bobby Slowick was made available. And I'm just kind of curious to get your thoughts on the job that he's done with this receiving core, the quarterback, just the multitude of issues they've had on offense with the offensive line, trying to figure out the run game. I'm sitting back today and I'm thinking, this has got to be the most difficult game to prepare for, not just for C.J. Stroud, but really for the entire Texans organization this week. Just taking into account, this is a shorter week because of Thanksgiving, so you lose a day of practice. Hmm. C.J. Stroud's coming off of a three-interception game, and so he's probably had to study a little bit more film this go-around than he typically does, trying to correct some things. This game obviously means first place within the AFC South. You've got more eyes. You've got more TV, more media stuff to do. You have all of these things going on. You're getting new pieces back. It's got to be a whale of a game for them to prepare for. How do you see this game shaping up, just knowing everything that you do about both of these teams going into it? Obviously, the Jags coming off of a massive victory over the Titans and the Texans. Uh, find another way to pull another one out this last weekend. Yeah, and uh, I feel like this is kind of a, a two-part question because you start by talking about Bobby Slowick and what he's done this season is just so demonstrably impressive. The The easiest way to win in the NFL and what I think often when we watch people who succeed in this league is they have the best players. And what Bobby has done, and I do think part of this has been leaning into C.J. Stroud and his greatness, and that's a different topic, but it's been, hey, when you don't have that strong interior OL – we're going to scheme up ways to make sure that the defensive lines can't wreck our game plans. We might not have a, a game wrecking wide receiver, but we've got these guys with really unique skill sets and different ways they can be used. And what happens if we maximize all of them and the run game for, for all of the fits about it. Hey, what's, and it's been kind of a tangle this season. How do we integrate the running game in with who we want to be and Bobby Sloak has just been, he's been adaptable. He has not been rigid to what they thought they might have wanted to be at the beginning of the season. And more and more, we're watching him lean into CJ Stroud looks like an MVP caliber quarterback. And I can't believe I'm saying that, but that's what he's been. So when, when you ask about Bobby Sloak, I think he's created a, an offense that's really ready for any challenge. And I think that transitions well to talk about the Jacksonville game that when we talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars, it's a team that under Press Taylor's play calling, they've kind of struggled this year. Calvin Ridley, it's not been the smooth transition they hoped for. Now, he's really struggled when Zay Jones doesn't play. I do think Zay Jones will be back this week, but it's a team that hasn't meshed all of the parts, even if on paper you would think, okay, year three, Trevor Lawrence should be the better quarterback. Travis Etienne's the best running back, and their receivers have a little more experience than Houston's, but they're not is well orchestrated right now. And I think their defense has played really nice, but coming into this game, I, I think it's one that Houston can be well capitalized to win, which I can't remember the last time I say, I was saying this, but just because of the strength of Houston's coaching staff and how they prepare and a group of players that have really bought in, whether that's CJ Stroud, not being afraid to make mistakes and consistently executing with the game plan or a defense that is just, I mean, rabid to go make plays uh, it's, it's a game I think Houston can come out on top. John, according to uh, Next Gen Stats, the Texans' front seven looks pretty elite. Their pass rush win rate, 56%, third in the NFL. Their run stop win rate, 34%, fourth in the NFL, third and fourth in those two categories. The Texans' D gets treated like a dull mashed potato side in your Thanksgiving meal compared to the delicious C.J. Stroud main course are, are we underselling 
this defense? I think to a degree we probably are undersigned this defense, and a big part of it is there. there's not a lot sexy about what Houston's doing right now. Obviously, Will Anderson, a lot of press after being selected third overall. But what they've done is real on the backbone of guys like Jonathan Grenard, who was drafted a third overall in an otherwise totally forgettable 2020 draft. Guys like Sheldon Rankins, who despite bringing in a huge paycheck in the offseason, and you could put Malik Collins in this category too, people that don't get national recognition for how they play a defensive tackle. And then a group of linebackers that I don't know how to describe it other than D'Amico Ryan's magic from bringing Blake Cashman, who was on the outskirts of the Jets team, to him being probably the Texans' most effective linebacker, 19 tackles this week. And Christian Harris, who so often looked lost as a rookie, all of a sudden he looks fantastic in coverage. And you throw in Denzel Perryman to that, you throw in good secondary play. And yeah, I do think we're probably underrating the defense. It's hard, though, when you're next to the spotlight of, as we already talked about, Bobby Slowick's offense and just how well that machine is rolling. I mean, I think it's obviously better than what we all could have expected, but we should have, and I think to a large degree, did expect this defense to significantly be improved. You look up now, and I think they're the 12th ranked defense overall in the in the league, but what they've done run defense-wise, you know, five of the last six games, they've held their opponent to less than 100 yards in a game. That's an average of 3.2 yards per carry. And we talked so much about wanting D'Amico Ryans to be the next head coach of this organization because of his defensive prowess. And, and that's the one facet of the game that you could feel pretty darn good about. And it's just so funny because I do agree with Robert and his assessment and the way that he framed that question that, yeah, this is kind of forgotten about because CJ in this offense has been so damn good. But talk a little bit more about that run game and how it could match up against the Jacksonville Jaguars team that you know, look, they can run the ball. Their offense seems to be clicking a little bit more. We talked about Calvin Ridley. He came off a monster game this past week against Tennessee. Trevor's playing, you know, some cleaner football now than what they'd seen from him in week three. They're two very different teams, and the Texans seem to have a lot working very, very well in their favor defensively now, starting to see actual results. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be a different matchup than that week three. I was able to go to Jacksonville for that game, had a, a great time watching. It was really a, a C.J. Stroud stepping onto the scene game, but of course there, there's a lot of one-game outliers in the NFL. I don't think people started paying attention until the next week at Pittsburgh. But what happened that week with the Jacksonville offense, we saw them, they, they shot themselves in the foot multiple times. Calvin Ridley dropped the touchdown. Christian Kirk didn't execute well. That whole run game just did not work. And when we fast forward to what we're seeing when everyone's healthy, and I mean, especially last last week, what they were able to do, it, it is a dynamic group of pass catchers. There's no way around that. Zay Jones is going to threaten you from one side, and it's opened up Calvin Ridley to, to move around and be used both in the slot and stacked bunches and on the outside um, is a really effective wide receiver, kind of what they hope to be from that number one role. And of Kirk, of course, uh, Christian Kirk for his lot is that contract was, I think he's become one of the NFL's most effective slot receivers. He has to belong in that conversation right now. And a bit of a breakout year for Travis Etienne, how effective he's, he's been uh, Trevor Lawrence. I think a lot of dialogue about what is he right now? Is he this elite quarterback that he was billed to be? Because what he's doing, I do admit, I, I love the term that greatness is, it's like light. It just kind of, it shines the truth on everything. You get to see exactly what things are. And when you've got someone like CJ Stroud in the division, it's like, oh, this is exactly what the franchise quarterback role is supposed to look like. And what really unprecedented greatness, what Trevor was billed to be, this is what it would look like. It's raised questions, but still, that is a, a great, effective quarterback. And I think Houston's going to be tested in, in every fashion this way. The cornerbacks, these are tougher responsibilities than they've seen the last few weeks. When they've been playing, I think safeties, obviously Jalen Petrie's had a pretty tough time, but they're going to be pushed vertically and they're going to need to be quick enough to come underneath. And for the run fit, ETN is as dynamic a, a one cut guy can be for how they like to use him. And of course, Tank Bigsby complimentary with how they'll play power. It's going to be tough for Houston, but I, I do think, like you said, there are some things trending that, and it's just so, so weird, so fun to talk this way about the Houston Texans. I, I think they can do it though. I feel confident that they're coming into this game and they've shown us there's no reason not to believe that they can win this one. 
I got something for both of you guys. Do you care whether the Texans get flexed to prime? Of course, the story came out. The Texans are uh, moving from three to noon for the Denver game. Fans, you know, kind of reacted. I understand the fans who tailgate wanting a Sunday nighter, so they're not getting up at the crack of dawn. But, you know, how do you guys feel? Should it even matter? I was on the conference call with Mike North um, yesterday. And, you know, as I'm listening to him kind of describe, you know, everything that goes into doing these kinds of things and what the networks look at, what the NFL is looking at in terms of making these decisions, like fans pay attention to this stuff. And I do kind of care, you know, from a fan perspective for the fans that, you know what, I, I know they didn't flex this Jags game and they hadn't done it to this point, but man, I'm looking at that week 14 game against the Jets and how perfect it just sets up the fact that the Packers and the Giants are playing Monday night in that same damn stadium. So it would just be an easy flip. And I care about that because one, it's Monday night and we've been talking and hearing players and coaches speak about how they want NRG packed. And I just think that would give the fan base that much more juice to where the next time that the Texans come back and they play at NRG, I think it's week 15 or week 16, whatever it is. I think fans, you know, if they don't do it between now and then, I think they certainly will because they're in when they know everybody else is in. When they know everybody else cares and is paying attention to their team, that gets them excited. Like, it's the FOMO. They know this team is relevant. They know this team is playing well. They know this team could be in first place to close a business on Sunday. And so I think in that sense, yeah, I care because of what I think it would mean to the fans. And I think I fall in the same category that, I mean, thinking objectively as an analyst, someone that's watching around the league. Sean, you and I both, we know it, it doesn't matter when you play the games. I think yeah. that the recognition that Houston wants is coming next year. We're going to see a lot of CJ Stroud primetime games over his career. But from someone who loves this team, as someone who's excited with what's been going on, I think that's how fans feel. Yeah, I, I absolutely do care about being flexed and getting more eyes on this team because it feels like an acknowledgement of what's happening. It's not just a flash in the pan. Like they're not just a fun Cinderella. And you know, they, they are kind of a Cinderella story, but also I think yeah. it's a wider acknowledgement of, hey, they're building something very special. And I think people hear that locally, people who follow other Houston sports teams. It's been so fun to, to be online and watch people who love the Astros or love the Rockets kind of tune back into the Texans and say, hey, can you, can you tell me more about this? What's going on? But I think when you expand that to the general fan, move, being moved to, like Sean's talking about, a Monday night football, it's a recognition of this thing is it's very real. And I think they're deserving of – this isn't just a team that's one game back in the AFC South. This is a team that's one game back of the number one seed in the AFC right now, the Kansas City Chiefs. There are seven wins. The Texans are at six wins. Like This is a team that is not just going to make the playoffs, but there are going to be plenty of people that pick them to win their playoff game wherever they land. So I just think that recognition of this team is moving in the right direction and what's going on in Houston is real and that to be acknowledged by the league, it would mean something, even if it doesn't really mean anything. Hey, John, I'm going to get you out on this. I know you got to run for the holidays, but are the Texans fans going to wake up Monday morning first place in the AFC South? Robert and Sean, thanks, thanks again for having me and happy Thanksgiving to both of you guys. Uh, I would answer an emphatic yes. I expect NRG to be rocking. This is a team that's played better at home. I think there are so many things that go towards the Texans right now in this contest, whether that's the momentum, whether it's having this game at home, and just a young group of guys who seem so hungry for every win they can get and shrouding off all of those kind of those false narratives that were written about the team. I'm going to take them. I think they know how to play Jacksonville. They always play well against it. And I think they, they do match up well where it matters. I think it's going to be a lot more competitive than the last game. We're probably not going to see. I, uh, was, I was talking to a, a buddy last week who's a Jaguars fan. I said, you probably should have folded the franchise when someone with a number in the 40s ran back a kick return for the touchdown. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know if Andrew Beck is bringing that back again, but I do think, CJ Stroud is the best quarterback on the field. I do think this is the best coach team on the field. And I think that they week after week show that they want to prove something. So I, I think so. I think on Monday, I expect and will not be surprised if the Houston Texans wake up in first place in the AFC South. Hope you're right. Happy Thanksgiving, man. Me too. All right. Happy Thanksgiving, y'all. Thank you so much for having me.
Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. A little question that I didn't get to, but I, I want to ask you about Pat McAfee was given J.J. Watt a little grief about him rejoining the Texans. J.J. said he's been working out at NRG. I don't know if you've seen him, but he's been working yeah. out with the guys, doing a little coaching. Watt didn't say no way when McAfee suggested a comeback. <clears throat> Is that nuts? Could we see J.J. Watt? Could D'Amico convince him? I think it's weird that D'Amico, tongue-in-cheek, kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, tried to <laughs> convince J.J. to suit up, you know, during his press conference today. I was just like, man, D'Amico's on this train, too? Because I, I think it's silly. I guess we've seen crazier things, you know, with Rob Gronkowski and how he's handled his two retirements. Did he retire twice? come back two different times or was it once I, I can't remember but I mean it would be awesome I did not see JJ on the premises today didn't see him working out I just heard about it and I heard his few clips on the McAfee show I do know this for a fact the only reason he's in town is because he's got family here and he's doing Thanksgiving here this week that's it and if you recall before when he was in town earlier this season to get inducted into the ring of honor he did the same thing he woke up at four o'clock in the morning and went to NRG and worked out you know, with the trainer that's been there for a long time. And he loves it. Uh, he's always talked about the facilities at NRG. They're top notch, they're the best. And he's player emeritus. He can go and come as he pleases anytime he wants to. So I, I think that's kind of where it's going to be, uh, where it should be left. He's not coming back. It's a cool thought, but I think you should probably leave it there. Isn't he coming back because Killen's Barbecue's uh, turkey or so? Do they make a turkey? Is that the reason why maybe he's back in? I just figured maybe there was some connection because you know he loved Killins for what I heard. My sister lives out in Pearland and and he yeah. he was out at that place every now and then. Well, they hooked him up, uh, you know, when he was in town for the Ring of Honor and he had his Airbnb. He walks into his Airbnb and there was a huge barbecue display there for him. And yeah. <laughs> you know, Killins always takes care of him. I imagine if they don't do turkeys, they're probably doing a turkey. Uh, this time of year, this week, it's probably a specialty, but I know he's in town for Thanksgiving. That's about it. And hey, look, I didn't see JJ at the game this past weekend. I didn't know if they showed him on the big board or not, but hopefully he sticks around after Thanksgiving and goes to the game. Certainly would have thought that he'd be there with, you know, two of his former teams going head to head against each other. That would have made a lot of sense. Maybe it makes less sense that he'd stick around for Sunday's game against the Jags, even though it is for first place. But it would definitely be cool and add a little bit more juice for a moment in NRG, which the fans, they've been awesome. The ones that have been there, I ain't worried about the blue seats and the red seats, the ones that aren't there. They've been great. But man, if they show JJ on that big board, that would just be give even more life to that stadium and the Texan can certainly use it. Yeah. You mentioned Stroud earlier as an MVP candidate. I'm going to talk about Stroud a little bit as an MVP candidate, but I still can't believe Sean JJ did not win the MVP in 2014. Does anybody remember yeah. how crazy that season was? Sean, he had 20 and a half sacks, 51 quarterback hits, 29 tackles for loss, 57 solo tackles. I think it's been no 59 solo tackles, 10 passes defense, five fumble recoveries, five fumble recoveries, 10 passes defense for a defensive lineman, an 80 yard interception return for a touchdown. I'm still not done. He caught three passes on offense. All three were touchdowns. The Texans won nine games that year with Ryan Fitzpatrick and Ryan Mallett starting 14 of the 16 games. We're never going to see another defensive player do anything close to that in our lifetime. And Sean, you're wondering like, oh, who was the MVP? Aaron Rodgers was the MVP, 38 touchdowns, five interceptions. They won 12 games, but we won nine games with Ryan Fitzpatrick and Ryan Mallett quarterbacking 14 of the 16. And I think Case got a couple of games here also. I mean, <laughs> It's it's unreal. I mean, it's we're not <laughs> yeah. going to see that. We, we'll never see it again in our lifetime. If a defensive player can't win an MVP that year, then you can't win an MVP as a defensive player, which I kind of feel like that's a little bit ridiculous, too. Yeah, I remember be having those conversations at the time, how ridiculous it was. I mean, we were raising holy hell on the radio, you know, every single day. You're right. <laughs> if, if that dude as a defensive player can't win MVP that year, then it's probably just not going to happen because he literally did it all. A career high, 20 and a half sacks that year for him. And, you know, he's done it twice. He did it twice during his career, 20 and a half sacks, but never anything like that 
total package that season. It's still crazy. And look, personally for him, he's probably looking at it like, I mean, I was the best defensive player, you know, so I was the best on my side of the ball. And that's, you know, probably the most important recognition, you know, for him at the end of the day. But it would be nice to have MVP next to J.J. Watt's name at at the end of the day. Yeah, he caught three touchdowns. Did Aaron Rodgers get three fumble recoveries and play a little bit on defense? No, I don't think so. And look, (laughs) let's be honest. It just becomes a quarterback award. This is my belief. There should be like, you know, most valuable quarterback of the year or quarterback of the year or something like that in the NFL. And they should have another award that should mean just as much, if not more, as the best player, just best player, period. And that way, you know, you can go, okay, at your position, you were so far better than everybody else that you're the best and and start looking at it in those terms instead of how much did you contribute to winning? Because we all know the quarterback is always number one contribute. I, I just don't like the way they, yeah. they set it up there because it just it feels like nobody else has a shot. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I I totally get it. I guess I would like to see something like that. But another part of me is I don't want it to be too watered down, so to speak, an award for this, an award for that, and then an overall award. Like, I kind of think, you know, about college football. You know, you have the Heisman Trophy, and then you have whatever the awards named for the best quarterback in the country. Like, Dugan won it last year for TCU. And then, you know, he's the best quarterback, but he's not the Heisman. And it's like, well, what is that all about? Um, I mean, look, but players- yeah, but my point, my point is though, is like, yeah, you, you can be the best quarterback and not the best play. You know, that's that that's what I'm saying. It you yeah. know, if you're so great at what you're doing that nobody else is even close, you know, because a quarterback is just they have so much influence on a game. It's like um you know, they, they don't want to give the pitcher the the MVP as much anymore because we've made it to where there's a Cy Young and then there is an MVP. And, yeah. and, and you know, they th- that way it differentiates. Anyway, I, let me get to Stroud for a second because <laughs> he should be the front runner. I mean, I said it on Sunday. I'm, I'm back at it, double backing it. I looked at the numbers, number two in passing yards, three in passes per attempt, three in lowest interception percentage. Fewer picks than all the front runners. He's got, you know, yeah, still. still still took over the second worst team in the NFL, lost five offensive linemen for the year, and his run game stunk for most of the season so far. And and, and even if it, you know, it looks good from here on out for half the season, he didn't have a running game. I, yeah. You know, it, it just, like, for me, I, I'm just, I look at the board and I'm like, why are these other guys, look, Mahomes? He's not had a good year. Yeah, you could say he doesn't have the receivers. I, wait, I didn't I hear that the Texans didn't have good receivers? Like just like three months ago, like our receivers suck. All of a sudden, oh well, Mahomes is having a great year, even though their offense is in the, even though his numbers aren't as good as CJ Stroud because he doesn't have anybody. He has Travis Kelsey. The Texans don't have anybody. They didn't come in into the season with anybody as good as Travis Kelsey. There's a lot of factors at play, and it's the incumbents. It's the powers that be. They're always going to get the nod above the Cinderella story, the newcomer, so to speak. So, I mean, that's always going to be one and one A. But then, two, you know, eyeballs and the, or the lack thereof. You know, nationally, people, they know about C.J. Stroud and the Texans at this point in time, but they've got a couple of games worth. If they would have had, you know, five, six games worth, seven games worth at this point in time, they'd probably be a lot different of opinion. The point that you made in terms of the interceptions, you know, the three this past week against the Cardinals, that and the completion percentage are really the only two things that probably significantly changed for C.J. Stroud in that game. The pick's obviously a negative, but the completion percentage, he was 27 to 37 in the air for another 336 or 335, whatever it was this past weekend. So that only went up, you know, his completion percentage uh, amongst qualified quarterbacks, I think was towards the bottom. I think he would only rank like 22 out of all starting quarterbacks going into last weekend. So that shot up considerably going 27 to 37 and the picks he threw so few, he had the best touchdown to interception ratio of any quarterback in the league going into that game at 15 to two, you still throw three picks, but you get it in the end zone a couple of more times, or was it one? Um, I mean, it's still the best. So yeah, from a statistical standpoint, he's the dude, but from just the eyeballs or lack thereof on the product and the player, I totally get it. They keep doing what they're doing 
And even if CJ plays, I think, at somewhat of like an average clip of what we've seen of him to this point through 10 games, I think the statistics are going to be overwhelmingly there to where he's got to be absolutely seriously considered for that. But it's going to be very difficult any year to beat out a guy like Pat Mahomes and some of the other powers that be. Earlier, I talked about the next-gen stats on the defense. Next gen stats on Will Anderson, Sean. I'm just going to throw this out here for you, and You're cool. yeah. you can uh, re react to it. He ranks first in run stop win rate, fourth in pass rush win rate, first and fourth against the run. He's being doubled at a 20 percent rate, highest among edge defenders, and yet he's still winning at the highest rate against the pass. He's being doubled 22 percent of the time, the seventh highest rate. So, Sean. He's being doubled against the pass nearly two and a half times as much as Miles Garrett, just to give you some idea of how good he's been. Is that uh, are those stats for rookie edge rushers or all edge rushers? I, I got the impression from the numbers that, that I saw that I think whatever I saw, wherever I saw it, it was for all. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, and rushers. well, the reason why I ask is because I feel like I remember seeing like the numbers of the double teams at one point in time at 24%, which were not near as high as what people made them out to be. And then, you know, at 20% now, like, all right, where did that drop off come? And I'm wondering if there was just a disparity between like stats overall versus stats versus just rookie edge defenders. But well, it's it's um, 20 against the run and 22 against the pass. So I, I don't know if that's like 21 overall huh. or something. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. And it wouldn't be that steep of a drop off anyway. But I mean, the numbers are really good. I don't care if you're just breaking them down amongst rookie edge defenders or all edge defenders. I mean, the stats are really cool. I saw. A lot of those, you know, over the course of the last few weeks, been keeping track of those. But at the end of the day, just like look and see the way that he's playing. That guy is high motor, full go, 110 miles per hour every time. He's affecting plays and he's been missing plays. Just go back to this last week. He missed a couple of sacks just by that much. You got the personal foul call on Kyra, Kyler Murray. You know, he just kind of dipped down where... You know, he's trying to wrap around and look like maybe try to get ball. Instead, he got a handful of face masks. That hurt him, obviously. But he was he seemed to be more involved and disruptive this past week than I think he'd been in, in maybe the last month plus easy. And I thought that matchup, you know, worked perfect in the Texans and Will Anderson's favor going up against a mobile type quarterback like Kyler Murray, matching speed and athleticism with one another. And I thought it just worked perfectly. And at the end of the day, it worked out really well for Anderson and the Texans. But stats are amazing. He keeps doing what he's doing, man. And look, he was a DNP today at practice, but knock on wood, if that dude stays healthy, however they need to manage him and his knee, he's he's going to be a problem. Uh, opposing opposing offenses are definitely looking at that cat and having the game plan for him. I want to show a little love for the George Fant signing. Don't forget that he signed Fant, Casario did, on July 28th, right at the start of training camp. It was a one-year, $4 million deal in 10 weeks. Fant's given up one sack, had three penalties, and a pro football focus grade has him at 66. Keep in mind, Titus got his big extension off a season very similar to this. In fact, the way it works out, he's going to have a better season in some of those numbers than Titus did. Uh, so I'm just going to toast him, Sean. I'm going to toast Casario for what he did, but also you got to toast George Fant at your Thanksgiving table. Yeah, why not? Don't forget he had, you know, potentially a game saving tackle, you know, this past weekend too, after the interception. Cause that very easily, right. if he's not there, could go for six. The dude is a baller. He's an athlete, basketball background. That's the uh tip of the hat to the athleticism there. I mean, there's no question. That was a huge signing. And I, I feel like, you know, it's it's been a long time, but it hasn't been a long time. <laughs> you know, as I was saying earlier, you know, Scruggs, you know, him being at practice today made me think like just how fast the season's gone. But when that signing occurred, I think like all was fine and well with the Texans offensive line at the time. And then right. it starts going boom, 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 boom. You know, Questenberry goes down and then they just seem to start dropping like flies. Titus breaks his hand like a week and a half later. And it was just like, Holy smokes, you didn't know what you were in for, but here we go. One of the most uh, 
pivotal, impactful depth signings that Casario's had. There's no question about that. And I'm in the group that says, I don't care if you've got the fourth highest paid right tackle on the team not playing said position, so long as George Fant is doing as serviceable, if not a better job than the fourth highest paid right tackle would be doing there, presumably, (laughs) you don't make a change. You're trying to get the five best dudes and whoever's performing at the five best positions, you know, we're going to roll with that. Gets a little tricky with some healthy bodies um, in this week being uh, infused with Juice Scruggs. Yeah, you said not a lot of injuries, but I don't think they would have signed Fant if Charlie Heck didn't have some yeah. concerns. Yeah, he's about never him. been healthy <laughs> until this yeah. last couple of weeks. Yeah. So in a way, it maybe helped the Texans because I don't know if Charlie would have been anywhere close to this good. It might have helped him that Charlie did go out and they did have to go sign George Fant. And who knew all maybe. this was going to happen? Also, you know, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned him a couple of times now, Juice Scruggs designated for return. W- what are you hearing about that? You know, what do you think is going to happen if he does come back? Do you think he actually starts and plays for sure? Or do they use him as depth or, you know, and how soon could that? I mean, what do you know? Well, I asked to speak to Juice Scruggs today and they said they're not supposed to make make him available until he plays a game. They're not going to do that, even though that's what protocol typically is. My impression is that they're going to make him available Friday. We'll have to wait and see there. So I have no pulse on anything in regards to how Juice is feeling other than just reading the same piece of paper that everybody else has at this point, and that's that he was a full participant in practice today. So that's cool. But just keep in mind this and how the Texans typically handle you know, guys coming back from injury. There's a, a ramp-up process. It's typically been a week, and it depends on the injury. And obviously with Juice Scruggs, he's taken a lot longer to recover and be ready to come back to, you know, practice with a hamstring injury than anybody else dealing with that type of soft tissue injury this season, particularly for the Texans. So I would anticipate this week being a ramp-up week. Maybe most importantly because there's no practice Thursday. It's Thanksgiving. So you're already taking one important day out of the week you know, for these guys. I just don't anticipate him being a factor. Now, maybe, maybe depending on the health, you know, throughout the course of the week of other linemen, maybe he's active, you know, for game day. But I I just, I don't see it. I mean, to me, if you're the Texans, you have to pretend like he's not there and operate status quo as they had been with him out. Next week is a big week for Juice Scruggs. I would anticipate him. If everything goes well the rest of this week, you know, with practice on Friday, a walkthrough on Saturday, and uh, everybody's healthy on Sunday, I think next week is a huge week for Juice Scruggs. And then they have decisions to make. One thing I'll note is today the Texans didn't allow us to shoot the first team takeoff for the first time all season. And I was like, well, hell, okay, why? (laughs) That's weird. Let me pay extra close attention to this. They had – The weirdest first offensive line ever today, and it was, let me go left to right, it was some dude named Jalen Thomas at left tackle, at right guard, Uh, I have to reference my Twitter, Uh, who was at right guard, I can't remember, oh, it was Juice Scruggs, and then it was Michael Dieter, and then it was Shaq Mason, and then at right tackle, Charlie Heck, (laughs) and I was thinking like, man, this is weird, why? You know, and only reason I could come up with is, hey, this is their first time they've been healthy and able to do this, you know, with Heck and Scruggs. Let's get these guys some one rep, I guess, you know, for whatever that's worth with the starters and see how it goes. That's the only thing that I can give you there. Uh, You'll have to wait and see what the case is on Friday, what that looks like. The Texans have done some hokey things on the offensive line. They've shown you one thing on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at practice, done a completely different thing before in pregame warmups versus what they actually trotted out on a Sunday. So just wait and see. Dylan Horton, the news came out that he's taken a leave of absence for personal health reasons. Is this like a mental issue Sean or something of that nature. Like it was very, it was very not specific on that whole deal. And it's on purpose. Uh, It's a personal matter. I can tell you that it's not mental health related. And that's all I can tell you at this point in time. Um, Just, you know, the letter that uh, Dylan Horton, you know, wrote that was released today. 
you know, he mentioned that at some point in time, there's going to be updates and the Texans are going to respect his wishes. We're going to respect their wishes. So I would presume over the course of the next week, two weeks, maybe even a little bit longer down the road that Dylan Horton and the Texans will get together and, you know, provide a little bit more of an update in terms of, you know, how he's doing, what's going on and be a little bit more specific at that point in time. But, you know, just given the holiday season, what he's dealing with, you know, personally, I think they're just going to kind of, um, you know, give him the space at this point. What are you thinking about as far as the Jacksonville game? Is there any, you know, right. angle that you're looking at on this thing? Yeah. Yeah. And you can tell me what you think about it. I was thinking about this a little bit earlier today. Um, and then more so as the, the days kind of gone along. And I mentioned it with Crumpler. I, I really do believe this. And I, I, I couldn't really figure out a good way to ask, you know, CJ Stroud, this question who was available today. And he looked kind of like he was in a rush too to kind of get out of there. So I just decided to put it in my back pocket. But if, if I'm the Texans, this is the biggest preparation week all season. For, for the team, for Stroud, I mentioned him coming off of a three-interception game. It's a short week. It's for first place within the division. You're getting new bodies, you know, potentially onto the team, healthy bodies. Um, maybe you're missing some other healthy bodies. You know, you never – some unhealthy bodies, rather. You don't know who you're going to have. It's just kind of in flux. It's a big week of prep. And then, look, the Jags, I don't know who this team is really. I haven't figured them out all season. I know they're playing better football. I know they beat the brakes off of the Titans this last week, but that's two weeks removed from getting stomped by the 49ers. So I don't really know who the hell they are yet. And then while I'm looking at this Texans team, I look at a team maybe I could I could parse it up into two different ways. One that's kind of learning, as D'Amico has said, throughout the course of the season, one that needs to be better at pre preparation and learning how to respond after wins. Well, hell, they've won five of their last seven, and they've won three in a row for the first time since 2018. So I think they're doing a pretty good job in terms of being consistent at preparation and execution during the week. But then I look at it like, you know, they're playing this complimentary football but it was a completely different type of complimentary football game this past week against, you know, one of the worst teams in the entire NFL and the Cardinals. You shot yourself in the foot again repeatedly, but your defense was so damn good against an offense that it really should have been pretty good against, if we're being honest, that it, it worked out. You know, how many teams can survive three interceptions by their quarterback, two particularly in the red zone? So I don't really know that just how big this week and it being a short week and a big game. It, I'm very skeptical about the Texans home game or not going in against this Jaguars team, which they should have a chip on their shoulder. They're going to be healthier. They're coming off of a big win, but the offense is clicking a little bit. They're able to run the ball. Calvin Ridley, their dude they were counting on. He's coming off of a baller game, seven catches, hundred and some odd yards, two scores. So Texans red zone defense hasn't been very good this season. Those are the things that I'm kind of looking at that give me a little uh, pause when I'm I'm not as near optimistic as uh, Crumpler was in his take on this game this week. I'll just put it that way. Well, you figure a couple of things. Texans have Jacksonville's number, so that's in their favor. But you also figure, man, you know, it's just the NFL. As soon as you think you know a team, as soon as they're going great, then you get knocked down. and. Yeah. Also, it's interesting that, you know, I, I feel like the Texans are about as healthy as they've been since game one, almost, because when you look at the injuries, yeah, Jimmy Ward's out. The Denzel, we know Denzel Perryman deal, but the rest of the linebackers are now with Toa Toa coming back. And, you know, it's a, it's a little bit healthier group, the linebacking core now. Uh, defensive line's not too bad at this moment. And they're playing great. The defensive line's playing great. And, and Pierce is going to be back. So... When you throw all those factors in, and and even Sean, I think this this time we're gonna have is Noah Noah gonna play Noah Brown? We don't know yet. He was a DNP at practice today, as was Robert Woods, but that was a veteran rest day, most likely. I haven't looked at the report, see what they qualify that as. You know, he's dealt with a foot at times here and there, but he usually gets a veteran rest day on Wednesday, like Tunsil. But regardless, you have to keep this in mind. Full, limited, whatever the case may be. If they play on Sunday, you know these guys are banged up. You know they're load-managing Laramie Tunsil during the week. 
who's to say they're not going to have to start doing the same thing with Will Anderson? This is the second straight week. You know, he's been a DNP. We'll see what his status is on Friday, but he doesn't have a Thursday. Maybe rest is going to be good for him in that knee. I don't know. Point is, these guys are banged up, and everybody's well, banged up to some degree. Yeah, but yeah, who awesome. who can who can kind of just fight through these different little adversities that we kind of pass off as like, yeah, well, everybody else is dealing with the same thing too. It's a big week in that sense, in my mind, for the Texans, and I, I think it might be another big learning tool for C.J. Stroud in this new group. Because I don't want to say a young team because there's a good mix, young and veteran. I think that's a reason why they are where they are right now. But I think it could be another learning tool, a week they look back on and say, ha, you know what? And we we figured, we fought through that. We'll be better next time for it. Any chance that you would want to see the Texans one day back on a Thanksgiving? Or do you like the Texans playing on Thanksgiving or you would just – I know it's different for us because, you know, we're, we work at a lot of that time when you have a Thanksgiving. How do you feel about that, wanting to see the Texans on a Thursday? Who doesn't want to play on Thanksgiving Day, man? You know, uh, do I want my team playing on Thanksgiving Day where eyeballs are on them? They're out there, you know, with the opportunity to play a great game, a memorable game where you're going to – people might reference you for years and years to come. Yeah, who wouldn't want that? Now, personally <laughs> – <laughs> uh, yeah. my wife would absolutely hate that if I had to go work a Texan game. Like if the Texans played on Thanksgiving day, I would just hope that it would be a road game and I can yeah, sit well, back it, and enjoy it. <laughs> it, it. It would be unless they're playing that Thursday, the Thursday night, because the Lions and the Cowboys, that's the thing you're, you're off the hook as far as that, but still, you know, for our jobs, we, we got to have like super focus on the game and you're at a family thing. You know, if, if I'm doing the family stuff, I've got, you know, other, you know, distractions and people yeah. talking and all that sort of stuff. So it's a little weird. Now, I'll tell you what I would like to see. I, not just a Thanksgiving game. This is what I want to see. Texans playing specifically the Cowboys. I don't care about the Lions, but a Texans-Cowboys would be fun because, yeah. you know, I go back. I remember when I was a kid, it's one of the sweetest wins, one of the sweetest victories in Oiler history was when they beat the Cowboys on Thanksgiving in 1979. I want to say that was around the time Pastor Reedy was dating Farrah Fawcett, too. So he had a lot going on at the time, if, if I recall from his uh Got a lot his going book. for him, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that was, that was fun. And I think, you know, as much as there is distractions with the family, and as, you know, my family loves the Texans, but I, I, can, I can tell you this. The Texans are playing – they're focused on the game somewhat. The Texans are playing the Cowboys. It's a hundred percent more focus <laughs> than it would oh, be if they're just playing the Lions guaranteed. or the Eagles or somebody, you know. Guaranteed. Hey, if we could live in that fantasy world, you know, for just one year, I'd totally be down for it. Uh give me Texans and Cowboys on Thanksgiving Day. Absolutely. Yeah, and and I feel like the networks wouldn't hate it at this point with the way CJ Stroud and Dak Prescott and all that sort of that yeah. would be a fun matchup. So, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, go back and check out the highlights sometime when you get a chance, the Cowboys and the Texans. And, by the way, this week, it's a it's the anniversary of that game. It's now 44 years. But the the anniversary that um, is the game that really changed football in Houston, Texas, was 45 years ago yesterday. Oilers, saw that. Dolphins, Monday Night Football, um, just – you know, it, it literally put it in a way it almost put Houston on the map because, you know, they, they, the Oilers were nothing before that. They were a joke franchise. Then Earl shows up that year. Bum's already in place and boom, magic happens. You just go back. You watch that game on YouTube. The whole game's up on YouTube. The guy that put it on, by the way, he has got a whole Oilers set list of games from over the years, 70s, 80s, 90s. It's really cool. Yeah. And you look at that game and just the love that they were showing, the the Howard Cosell, Frank Gifford team, and they, they showed the, the, the Houston fans, Earl, the whole thing. I mean, it was, it was literally an event in history. And when Earl – ran for almost 200 yards and he had that run where he goes around, I think it was the right side, the sideline. And it's like 
towards the end of the game. It's one of his last carries, and the big guy breaks it into the open field and goes all the way for, a, I think it was something like a 78, 79-yard touchdown. I should have checked before I, I, I talked to you, but it, it was like something like that. It was it was a real moment. It was a real hey, moment. Just, in think, just think about this. If, and there's a lot of ifs in this big if, if the Texans uh, can come up with a victory on Sunday, be in first place within the AFC South, or be seven and four, what if they beat the Broncos the following week, eight and four? What if the next week that game is flexed to Monday night, Texans, Jets, you got all the New York eyeballs on it, all the national eyeballs on it, and you have the opportunity to be freaking nine and four at the end of Monday night. And CJ Stroud has one of his CJ Stroud type games, or Noah Brown does something, or Nico does something, or man, Tank does something. Damian Pierce has a rumbling run or something like that. Can you imagine the buzz that the Texans will have created? If that scenario plays out, you know, quite similarly, like this organization has been an absolute joke for the last three plus years, really four years, irrelevant in the NFL. If they're able to do that and be nine and four at the end of week 14, come on, bro. Come on. That would be something. That would be something like a rebirth, rejuvenation. Um, I mean, 2.0, 2.0, man. I mean, the C.J. Stroud era in the city of Houston per the NFL will officially have been born. And we will be the darlings of the league if you don't think we are already. The quarterbacks after Trevor Lawrence and Russell Wilson the next couple of weeks, Tim Boyle, Will Levis, Dorian Thompson Robinson, Will Levis, and Gardner Minshew. That's the list. Woo-hoo. I worry about some of those defenses, <laughs> but yeah, the quarterbacks, yeah. uh, quarterbacks are definitely, uh, <laughs> I saw somebody the other day post a, a picture. It was like a quad picture, you know, of like, uh, available quarterbacks, uh, you know, like ones that have just lost their job, like Mac Jones and Wilson in New York and, uh, Kenny Pickens, who's not playing very well. And I forget who the other guy was, but it was like, all right, which one of these guys would you want? And it was like, death (laughs) like none of them i choose death (laughs) it's kind of like that you know there's your quarterback matchups on the opposition but i do worry about some of those defenses and hey there's a lot that can happen man the nfl is nuts it's psycho you know every year uh you think you kind of got it figured out show me what some of these teams are looking like in the next two or three weeks and then we can talk All right, I'm looking forward to it on Sunday for sure. This is a biggie. Join us for the post-game show. Uh, Me and Sean will probably hit it somewhere in the neighborhood of 430, but just make sure to subscribe and have your notifications on. That way, you know exactly when we hit. Sean's going to be out at the stadium, right, Sean? For this one? Yes, sir, I'll be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we'll be ready Sunday. So looking forward to that. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Have a great one. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Hey, don't forget to support us by subscribing and commenting on YouTube. You can always listen to us on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends about us and share our show links on social media. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening. Touchdown!